to stop erosion, we have to learn about harvesting water. The first thing you consider to harvest on your land is harvesting water. Harvest the water comes from sky gratis. Hold it on, build swells, and I'm going to show you what it is, okay? Swells make pond and lakes and, all right? There are three things we should never do. Three things we should never do. Number one is burning. Burning is out. Friends, anybody on uh, outside the studio here, outside this auditorium, uh, please learn how to do it different way. Don't burn land, grasses, bushes, trees. Forget about making charcoal to pay the bills. Okay, you got to find better ways. There are better ways. Number two is no plowing or turning the soil except when you first landscape initial phase when you start a new land you need to fashion eventually your, your your farm your gardens that's okay and that's the last time okay put your tools back in, in the shed all right unless you work a new area number three third point you never cut a tree okay trees are sacred trees are precious if you really need it, one is on the way, you're sure about it, while well, you cut it. But if you cut one, what are you going to do? You're going to plant one, ten, twenty, hundreds to replace it. Okay, not just one, one for one, ten for one, twenty for one. Okay? Some trees here in these tropics are so easy to plant. You take a stick and you put it in the ground in a rainy season and they grow. Okay, we're going to tell you which one. All right, so um, I hope this is not too technical, but um, it's important. We have five essential things to consider. The first one is the soil. You need to know soil is not just dirt. Okay, soil is not dirt. Soil is a living complex organism system. Okay. Uh, you need to know your soil, you need to know a little bit the basis about soil, the soil composition, the three dimension of soil, you need to know about the physical, chemical, biological dimension of soils. You need to study a few books on this and uh, if you want to I can give you some references. Okay, number two, to consider to know your climate. You need to know your climate, one is the rainfall, one is the average rainfall, one is the warmest day, cold, coolest period, you need to know your climate. Go on Google, get the last 10 years in your area, and there you can uh, get the, you know, the, the basis 10 years average. It's not going to give you exactly when it rains, when it doesn't rain, but it gives an idea, okay? And people say, well, weather changes all the time. It does change all the time. At the same time, there are still patterns. Okay, so if you take on, on Google, you find that for every town, city, you find the last 10 years average. Uh, rainfall, temperature, okay, it's very important. So know your climate, because from your climate and your soil, you're going to determine in a wide arrays of plants called biodiversity, you have to have biodiversity. You must cultivate a lot of stuff. Cultivate as many as possible. Uh, at least 25 species per hectare, okay? This is your first goal, 25 species of plants for every hectare. If you have, a, if you have a two hectares, you go into 30, 40 per hectare, okay? The more land you have, the more diversity you need. If not, you can just start your problem with invasion of species you don't want to have, animals or plants, okay? Could be grasses, weeds, or insect or even animals okay the fourth point is the economy okay time is money how much time do you need to do something equipment can you invest can you not invest okay so this is the economy uh, cash flow you need to know that you can plant something in 30 days here you can harvest that's cash flow and it's food for you all right so which plant can you do will you do and you should do Number five is the ethics. Ethics is very important. Uh, most of the time is left out. Ethics is uh, being uh, uh, fair 
with nature, being fair with the environment, fair especially with water, and fair with people. Inclu includes your customers, includes your family, includes your business relation, and especially if you have your workers. When I make a business plan for a farmer, uh, I consider the people who will work on a farm, and beside the cash crop, they will eventually produce. I also tell them, I'm talking about the landowner, I tell the landowner to consider to keep some spaces on the land for the farmers for, so he can cultivate his daily food, vegetables and grains and eventually fruits. Okay. And that does not um, damage your, um, your own income on the contrary. Okay. For example, well, I'm going to give you some example later. Okay. Okay. So this is to know your soil. That's why I, call, I tell people, when you start somewhere, you're going to plant one tree. To plant one tree, we make a hole. We're going to make one tomorrow. You know, it's a hole. It's one meter, one meter, one meter, one meter deep. Okay? One cubic. And as you go one meter deep, you will see the different layers of your soil. Now, this is a good area. You can see some covering here. You can see some black. Uh, topsoil, this is topsoil. Most places here you have no more topsoil. And this is a between the rice straw. What's the ratio carbon nitrogen of rice straw? Anybody knows? More or less? It's not always the same. It's more green, more dry, more brown. Of course it changes. Roughly we would say it's 90 to 1. 90 parts of carbon and one part of nitrogen, okay? But remember, the ideal ratio to make compost is 30 for one part, those are parts, okay? So what do we have to do? What is the problem? What is, now of course, if you have a lot of time and you let your rice straw on a pile, what will happen? Eventually, it will, be, it will broke down, taken by all kinds of fungi, insects, and animals, and it will be turned into soil, it will disappear, okay? But it will be a slow process, and you have excess of carbon, okay? So if you have on your soil rich carbonated material on the soil, of course, if you put it in the soil, you're going to have a problem, okay? Some people rototill rice in the soil, you have a big problem if you do that. Why? Because you have now in your soil rich carbonated material, especially if it's more than five centimeter deep, the fungi, mushrooms, will not be able to break down the carbon and to turn into humus. It will stay as it will be all right. It will still be storing carbon in the soil, but you don't have a production of humus. And you need to know that soil in the Philippines went from 5% humus in the 1950s, and today you have 1.5% of humus in the soil today. Huh? Okay, so that's four or five. It takes it takes a hundred years, hundred years, in a forest of big trees, to increase percentage of humus in the soil. 1%, 100 years, 80 to 100 years. So what we have done through the so-called Green Revolution, which is not a Green Revolution, it was a Black Revolution, Bloody Revolution, we have used the accumulated carbon of five centuries of forest in the Philippines before the 1950s or the 1900s. We have been burning by adding chemical NPK, whatever you call them, yeah, 1414. 14. We have been burning a reserve of humus carbon in the soil accumulated over 500 years. Thank you very much, Mr. Rockefeller. Okay, and they made the farmers believe this is the only way to go. This is even the way to continue tomorrow. Well, when you have 1.5%, we know, they, we know now exactly 
when the soil breaks down. When, it, when you run below 1.5, you have to triple, quadruple, quintuple the amount of chemical fertilizer you put in because there's no more carbon. Now, we know how to synthesize a lot of stuff. We know how to make even fake diamonds. But one thing we don't know how to do, and we will never know how to do, we cannot make water, we know that. We cannot make air. And we cannot make carbon. We don't know how to make carbon, even though they say it's too much carbon in the atmosphere. Yeah, of course, because they're burning everything. Hmm? But we don't know how to put carbon in the soil. We don't know. Because carbon is made by trees. So what you have to do to make carbon? It's very simple. You've got to plant trees. <laughs> solution, we, I mean, the solution is here. Okay? So the solution is everybody, every one of us, has this need to have some basic understanding what's going on today. All right. So when you put carbon in the soil, straw, wood, anything in the soil, what happened? Well, the bacteria, they need two things to live. What do they need? It's like children, okay? Children, you give them a piece of bread, hmm? piece of bread, will they be happy? Maybe five minutes. Yeah. And then they will look around and say, what do I put on my bread? Huh? What is the peanut butter and the honey? Bacteria is the same, okay? So if I put carbon, bread, good rice, in my soil, where is the peanut butter and the honey? Where is nitrogen? Nitrogen, figuratively, in this little parable, represents is here. Nitrogen. Where is nitrogen? Where is the peanut butter and the honey? And you know what they will do? Since you don't give it to them, they will take it where it is. Where is it? In the soil, the accumulated reserve, they're going to eat the nitrogen here in the soil. Now, you plant a plant here. You plant a nice little cabbage, a nice little broccoli. Plant like this. And a month later, it's like that. Well, this is how come? How come? Hmm? Why? Because you put the carbon, not like nature does it, on the soil with other green material or half green or fruits or mixture of things that have come on the soil you put it into the soil only one time straw from rice when you plow when you plow your soil whatever whatever rice is left in the field that's why they burn it guess why they burn it so they don't have this problem well if you burn the rice field now you get another problem what's the problem you burn all the surface life. Hmm? What's going to happen now? Well, you're going to have other species, all the bad bugs coming to take over. And now you're going to have, on top of your lack of fertilization, no more humans produced. You're going to have the bad guys coming, the bad bugs, going to eat your rice, going to eat anything you plant. Do you see the problem? There's only one way to do it right, okay? And that's bringing a diversity of ingredients when you're making your compost. The very simple thing is to put enough greens, enough brown together. We work with colors. God had made it simple. God made it simple. Any farmer in the world can learn in five minutes how to do good compost. Putting enough green together, one part of green, two parts of brown, more or less. Okay, you cannot go wrong with that. Layers. When you make compost, I'm going to show you here. So compost, green manure, explain what it is, mulch, rock powders, rotation, association. That's a five way to fertilize. There is no six. This is all in here. All right. This is how every household should have one around the corner. When you make this, this is called cold compost. Uh, this is just a mesh fence. Okay, it's about one meter high. A family, it's one by one. You can make a two by two. Depends how many people you are. And every day you make a layer. You put your kitchen leftover, one layer, and one layer of rice straw. Hmm? Or grasses. So you make layers. One layer and you spread it around th thin like this. Kitchen scrap, 
two fingers, carbonated matter, rice, straw, whatever, three, four fingers. Light. Water a little bit, finish your job. Tomorrow, another layer or two. If you have more, you can make two layers one day. You know, Some day and should be done every day or every other day. Uh, okay? So this is a cold compost. It doesn't get hot. And when the, when the thing is full, when the thing is full, oh, by the way, it always looks nice and it doesn't smell. Okay? And when it is full, what do you do? Well, we have the fence here, there is some attachment here. We just open, okay? It's like a cake. It looks like this. You take this cake out, you make a pile, you water if it's too dry, you cover it with a tarp, and you wait until when you put your hand inside, you take it out, it smells good like soil forest. If you can see what it is, it's not ready, okay? So it's covered all the time, doesn't smell. You take it out, empty again. Well, just start a new, a new, a new, we call this a cake. Just start a new cake, layer by layer, enough green, enough brown. Very simple, enough water, don't walk on it, should be light, lots of oxygen. It's an aerobic fermentation. If it smells, it's because it turns anaerobic, okay, no air. All right, here we have it, okay. Now, this is a bad compost, I mean, not bad, just haven't covered that day the things. You never see, I mean, you put, you know what's in there, and then you cover. Very important. For the eyes, for the smell, and for the functioning. See, it's amazing how nature functions. When it looks good, doesn't smell, you have the approval. Bath, good, good for you, good job. When it smells, it looks ugly, bad job. All right? The cook needs to learn how to do that. Everybody in home needs to know how to do. Should be the turn, by the way. My home, every child has the role t day to make a week to make compost. Hot compost is the same principle, except instead of building it up little by little, when you have the material, we build, we collect the material and we put it up in one day. Okay? You look here. Okay, so you you mix the ingredients together, brown and greens. Okay, brown, one, one layer of browns, one layer of matter with more richer, more nitrogen stuff. Here you can see her layers, this is straw, this is chicken manure, this is leaves, broken leaves, this is grass, straw, chicken manure, horse manure, all the hay, chicken manure, leaves, straw, clipped grass, and then you cover it, you make sure it's wet. When you make this, you take it with your hands, you press it, you have one or two drops coming out. If it's dry, it lacks water. If it drips like a river, too much water, okay? Too much water will just add more dry material. You cover it with straw. If it's too rainy, you put a tar plastic over this part, okay? The idea is two meter wide and five kilometer long. Okay, okay. Two meter by two meter is a minimum. So you have to have enough ingredients. This is to be has to be built in one day. Okay? Very good. Okay. Build in one day. You see it has brown and greens, grass, clipping, anything. Okay? Banana leaves, fantastic. Fantastic <coughs> to make good compost. So grow bananas. Okay, this is sixty-five degree. It kills all the weeds, seeds of weeds. It kills all the pathogens, the bad, the bad guys get destroyed because the good bacteria are thermal pile and they produce heat and it kills all the bad guys. Okay, it's very hot. Um, <coughs> you make a lot of, this is a farm, a lot of compost. Through the summer, things are growing on it, no problems, you have for your harvest. After the harvest, you take the compost how to use a compost is as important as how to make it, okay? You are going to use a compost exclusively. I insist on this. You don't put... Okay, listen. Compost is aerobic. It has to remain aerobic. It's like yeast in your bread. 
The lady is a man who knows how to make bread. They know you take flour, water, and yeast. You put the mix the yeast into the, and you mix it. You introduce air into it, right? Because yeast produces the aerobic um, alcoholic fermentation. Okay. Leaven, natural leaven, is a lactic fermentation. If you use yeast from the baker, that's a, a alcoholic fermentation, not as good, but it's okay. Um, here's your soil. You put your compost two finger deep on the soil. One, two. Two is better. One is okay, two is better. You put it on the soil, fluffy as it can be, as snowflakes, and then you cover with carbonated material. Rice straw, leaves, okay? So you never burn rice straw, you never throw it away. It's gold. This is your gold. This is your bank account for tomorrow, okay? And that's it. And then you, you make, we have a, a piece of wood like this with a cone, you know, stick, and we just put it in here. We have our little plants, the cubes, uh, soil, our little plant here. We put the plant here. We have a water can with compost inside and water. We stir it like a cream, a light cream. We pour it here. We don't use a finger to close. We just pour our juices into this hole, and the little plant has to be big enough so you can see it, you can see light, and you go out, and you step out, okay? Without tilling the soil, between two, once your soil has been prepared one time, you're never going to go back and till the soil again. When your cabbage, your broccoli, whatever, are ready, are grown up, okay? Let's say you have reached the time where your plants are adult, this is your soil, this is your cover now, okay? This is your cabbage has been growing, okay? You take a bolo macheta and you chop it here and the root system, 50, 60 centimeter, you leave it there. You don't pull it out. Your tomato plant, your eggplants, you leave the roots down there. Because every root, if you take a microscope, take a microscope, you see this is root channel. This is going to be eaten up by bacteria. When this is eaten up, the air and the water will get in without you tilling the soil. Very simple. That's, that's practical, simple <laughs> strategy. Nobody does this, but it's... Huh? Okay. okay, now of course, here is the thing. If you think you can grow broccoli and another crop of broccoli same place next year, you are in trouble, okay? You do not grow the same thing within three, four years. So that involves rotation, okay, which is the fifth essential for fertilization, for, for farming, for growing healthy plants. So you need to have a rotation system in place well, you grow one thing now in one place, and next year you grow in another place. It's biblical. Okay, it's a biblical principle. All right, this is a nice tool to work, to work your soil. In case you have a very clay soil that restrict very much, you can use eventually this tool to loosen a bit of soil, especially the first two years. Okay, so you put in the soil, here's your stick here. You get it into the soil, Stand on it, okay, and then you're going to shake it just this way. You don't turn it, okay. You just shake. So you aerate, you bring air, but you don't move the layers because the first five centimeters here is aerobic, and everything else is anaerobic, no air. So if you put the bacteria here, on the surface, they die. If you, and if you put the top bacteria down there, they die. They've done a good job today. Okay? We all do this. We all have done it. Okay? Because we have been taught that way. But that's not scientific. That's a technique. Turn around. It's not science. This I use the compost, you see? You cover. You cover here. You compost bacteria, animals, 
will bring it slowly in, the rain, okay? So this is not your job. This is a little view of a cover crop, green manure, which is a very nice way to do large, large, large scale farming. This is a problem because it's, this is something we practiced about five, six years ago. Um, and the problem here is it's mono, monoculture still, okay? Today we, I will show you better systems. This is a dolly sauce beans. We grow no weeds, no pest, no insect because it recreates a little bit atmosphere of a jungle. Since then, we plant in between acacia trees who will fertilize also. This is a fertilizer, by the way. Prevents the weeds and it works as a fertilizer. It fixes about 200 kilo nitrogen per year per hectare using those beans for the bananas. That's all the bananas needs, okay? So it's a good system, but you can improve it. Here is the same with northern plants. Okay, this is all, this is how we plant, we cultivate today. This is a preparation of a land using 10 species of plants, corn, sunflower, phacelia, radishes. Radishes, we have radishes make roots like this. Mm -hmm. So we plant them, sow them, on a rainy season they grow, what do you think they will do? The roots will work the soil for you, make a big punch, and we just chop, we, we eat the greens eventually, we let them die, and that's a big cone of compost in the soil with no labor. Yes, good for you. Good news. Okay. And that produces 30 tons of compost a year. Not bad. Just a few minutes or hours of work. So you can see the system in different places. Then we roll them down. We have this tool here to roll down all this green manure. Okay, we don't have to have um, engines, motor. One person with this can do a whole family garden in a few minutes. And this is called Lama Traca. Lama Traca is a very important tool that uh, exists. Uh, Vietnam has a lot, Mexico, all over South America. You can plant seeds, uh, beans, uh, sorghum, millet, maize, corn, everything. Not rice, but all the bigger seeds uh, without tilling the soil. Okay, you plant in a mesh. Soil is covered. Okay, you plant there. The plant will grow. This is the same principle mechanically, so we can also do a large scale without tilling soil. This soil has not been tilled. It's just scratched and you, you put the seeds. You see the seed is, the new seed is placed behind the crop, soil is covered. The soil is not returned, the soil is not cultivated at all. We have at the moment 150 million hectares in the world cultivated like this, mostly in South America. This is a plant called sorghum. We plant as a green manure, so we plant the sorghum. And in this one, we're going to plant with this machine, we're going to plant the next crop without plowing soil. We can do it, this machine, you plant one hour, one hectare, so you have 10 hectares one day all planted, okay? This is in France, the same machine. This is sunflower grown after wheat, while you plant in the mush, the next crop wheat is planted here. This will have absorbed all the nutrients. This will, they will die a few days after because the winter comes and the wheat will grow under cover. You can do the same with rice, okay? This is called association. Um, you see here, this, they, we can recommend small tractors. This guy kept his big tractor, so you roll the stuff, and behind, you plant at the same time. Soil is covered, so you grow your cover, okay? So this is sorghum. Sorghum is a cereal of the future. Forget about corn, forget about rice. This is the future. Uh, it tastes better than anything I know. You can make bread with it. Okay, this is bread made with sorghum uh, and sagu and camote. Okay, replaces wheat. You don't have wheat in this country. Uh, American wheat is very toxic food. Be careful. This is how we grow beans behind corn. Okay, you can do the same with rice. You roll down the rice when it's finished. 
you plant your, co your beans and you can move like this. This is again, this is straw. We don't cut the straw. We just harvest the top with machines. We leave them standing. They produce shade. At the shade of the straw, you can have a crop. Those are sunflowers. Okay, this is mustard. Okay, here again you can see there's no, there's no weeds. Maybe one or two. There's no herbicide used in this field. Okay, and no work. Okay, this is uh, impressive. This is in Australia. Uh, they are doing now millions of hectares this way. This is Ipilipil. Okay, we use it as a forager for animals and a fertilizer for the land in between. I show this picture. Here you can have all kinds of vegetables. The Ipilipil fixes four. This field will receive about 400 kilo per hectare of nitrogen. These Ipilipil, when they get bigger, they get slashed and cut, reduced to, to this height. They shoot back every year, twice a year, if it rains a lot. This is the way to go. We can, this is the, the Kaena Ipilipil. It's considered by some as a weed, as a troublemaker. It's the best ally of the farmers today in tropical areas. This is another one here, Albizia. This is a bigger tree. This is for the edge of your property. You should grow some of those. Okay, this is some of the machine we use.